Well, I gotta hand it to you, Google. I've been rocking the Pixel 8 for the past two weeks, and this has been the best Android experience I've ever... <laughs> Drew! Drew! Look, I found divorce papers. I just need you to sign right here. Dr Frankie, we're brothers. What, why would we sign... To... This doesn't make any sense. Why would we need... You know, because people sign these kinds of papers whenever they don't want to talk or communicate anymore. And that's how I feel towards you. I've already signed right here, so please, just sign right here. I am not legally your brother anymore. Frankie, I I'm going to need to get you in touch with a lawyer or, you know, maybe just a human being that can educate you on what these papers mean. Sign it, please. Right now. So here. M maybe we could settle for a restraining order. Could that be any better? Or just sign it. Are you going to sign it or not sign the treaty? This says right here I have to pay for Apple One Premiere for the rest of my life. W who wrote this? Don't read into the personal information. Oh my god, I can't do anything with you. Sorry, Frankie. But, uh, I kind of love the Pixel 8. So I know many of you probably found this channel based on how I've ranted on Pixels in the past, and many of you probably want me to continue ranting on Pixel hardware no matter what changes they make, no matter how much they listen, and continue praising and defending Apple hardware, whereas I think it's more appropriate and honest to basically reflect in your videos or your commentary how you genuinely feel on the current state of technology. So when Apple does something I like, I will continue to say what I like and don't like. And same thing with Google. In the past, I still stand by all of those earlier claims. I think they had really bad designs, really unreliable chips on the inside, very weak specifications for the money, and that's why I ridiculed and hated on Pixel so much in the past. But for me to continue complaining and criticizing when they genuinely have listened and they've genuinely implemented a lot of cool features and done a lot of things that I've wanted for years, I think it would just be stupid and kind of like playing a fake character to pretend to be someone else, to pretend to have any other opinion other than my own. What kind of person wants to play a character on video? Maybe a stupid brother who betrays his twin. That's true. Okay, good point to Frankie. But starting with the hardware, I should say that this is one of my favorite smartphone designs ever. I mean, Pixel 8 Pro is also great too with its more matte finish, but there's so many things that I've been asking for over on the iPhone team that Google is just straight up giving me here with this hardware, which I love. For one, the rounded glass back design, which fairly seamlessly meshes with the aluminum rails on the side. By the way, aluminum, it's recycled aluminum, good for the environment Google, on both the 8 Pro and the regular 8, which in my opinion is the superior chassis metal design. It's not quite as seamless as my iPhone 11 rounded chassis is, but it's still very comfortable in the hand, very hard to notice any kind of fingerprints. It doesn't collect oils or smudges. I think whichever color you get, aluminum is just, in my opinion, best material choice for a smartphone, while still rocking completely flat glass on the front, which I also love because now the image doesn't get distorted. We're finally past those weird ugly days of smartphones with the curved display bleeding over the sides and accidentally triggering it when you're just holding the phone, and I'm so glad we're done with that. Finally, the Pixel 8 marks the end of the slight pooling over pixels. Not to mention this is a $700 phone, not a $1,000 phone, and the bezels are super duper thin. There's just barely a little bit of a chin on the bottom, but it's really hard to notice. In fact, the chin of this Pixel 8 is thinner than the entire side bezel of the iPhone 11, which is what I was coming from. So it still felt like an upgrade, even if they aren't exactly symmetrical all the way around. They're pretty freaking close. Really hard to notice, honestly. And the display on this thing is fantastic. So I know this is a kind of common thing in the Android world, but as someone who's clearly been an Apple sheep most of my life, it's $700 new before trade-in discounts and everything, and still gets up to 120 hertz, which everybody was begging for, on the $800 and $900 iPhone 15s. This actually is rocking that actual smooth display and it still gets up to 2,000 nits. The same amazing brightness that we see on both the iPhone 15 and the 15 Pro, which is exceptional. I loved the iPhone 15 when I reviewed it and this display basically matches that same great brightness, which I have used out in the wild. It stays bright for quite some time. It like genuinely impressed me to where I was just using my phone, not thinking about the brightness until I got out of the car and I'm using it in direct 
sunlight and I'm like, holy crap, this thing gets bright while still retaining that buttery smooth refresh rate, which is awesome. The other thing that I've not wanted on the iPhone for years is the ringer switch because I don't feel like I'm the kind of guy that needs to switch between ringer on, ringer off all the time. I'm okay with that just being a software setting like it is on iPads. This does not have a ringer switch, which supports the whole minimalism design aesthetic, which I appreciate. And there's also no action button, which I've already seen a ton of people on Twitter saying that their 15 Pros don't utilize their action button all that much. So much so that they've now pre-mapped it to do nothing. So the action button is literally just a pointless fidget button on the iPhone that you can click and have it do nothing. So congratulations if you like fidgeting on your iPhone, but I'm in favor of no ringer switch, no action button, and that's what we get here. But more important than that secondary button that we don't need is the camera bump design, which honestly, if you go back and watch my videos, you want to talk about Drew's changed. Drew's not as consistent as he used to be. He used to say nice things about Apple. Honestly didn't, you're just forgetting it. And now he only says bad things about Apple. From the beginning, even all the way back in 2019, I was never really a big fan of the stovetop camera bump that we had on the iPhone 11 and that Apple has kept using all the way up until the 15 Pros. And they're probably going to continue using on the iPhone 16 series because it's too big of a camera bump and because I guess it's unreasonable nowadays to assume that the camera bump could ever be completely eliminated, especially since the Energizer phone still had to have one. So I'm like, okay, if you have to have a camera bump, at least make it kind of symmetrical across the back so you eliminate the wobble. And this is something Google has gotten right for the past few years. Having this camera visor allows you to stuff a ton of great camera hardware. Clearly, the pictures and videos this thing takes are amazing. You implement that across the back at the equal elevation so that when you let this phone rest on a table, it sits perfectly flush and there's no wobble when you're tapping it, which is a pretty common use case for me if I'm eating something and just kind of occasionally tapping my phone for videos or if I leave it resting on my desk while I'm working on my laptop. Not having that good, 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 every time I tap the display is super duper nice and yet still a problem anytime I use an iPhone because they always insist on that ginormous camera bump that seems to just be growing bigger and bigger into the top corner and that just increases the wobble every year. Even if you get a case, the camera bump has now exceeded the thickness that a case provides. So you still get that wobble even if you buy one of Apple's crappy fine woven cases. This fixes the wobble with no extra accessory required. I love that. Thank you Google and please Apple straight up just just copy this. This is fine. This works and it gives you more space for the MagSafe ring. That's pretty much the only hardware I feel like this phone is missing. You know LTPO would be better for battery life but I had great battery life with my Pixel 8 anyway so I'm not really too concerned that the refresh rate doesn't go down to one hertz. Not much would change for me in that case because I'm not a big fan of always on displays, but if they just supported Qi 2, which is basically the roundabout way of saying that if this had MagSafe ring support, which it kind of does, there are some magnets back here and I can charge this off of my MagSafe puck, but it's not super secure. Qi 2 has been announced and standardized already, so they could have supported it and they didn't. That's the one thing this Pixel needs, but maybe we'll get it next year. We'll see. But overall, just super comfortable in the hand. Great camera bump design. Love the button layout. I got very familiar with the volume buttons and the power button. Button. I love the Android like double click to activate the camera. I remember saying I liked that feature back when I first started reviewing Android phones like six, seven years ago, and I still stand by that. It is just nice to have a quick command like that. You can't do it on an iPhone because that's for Apple Pay, whereas Google Pay is just kind of always on in the background, which I'm personally fine with. And I'm happy to say the Tensor chip has been reliable for me, you know? It's like Google took a few generations to get it right with their silicon. I heard a lot of bad things about their first and second generation, but haven't had any overheating issues with this phone at all. Apps feel responsive and snappy. Things boot up very, very quickly. And I'm sure if we did a Geekbench test, it would not perform as good as Apple's A series of silicon. But I feel like we're kind of needlessly chasing performance metrics that we don't necessarily activate or find use cases for where it actually matters. Because I'm not exporting a ton of videos off my phone in the first place. And all modern day smartphone CPUs are pretty fast for what we use our phones for social media, taking photos and videos. Of course, we can still do 4K at 60 on the front and back with this phone as long as you want to, which was not the case the last time I did a big Pixel rant where it couldn't record at 4K at 60 and if you started recording for too long, the phone would overheat and have to shut down and I documented that experience extensively. Not happening here, so just very reliable, very consistent. Has not been a buggy experience with lots of shutdowns or app crashes like it did in the past. So I know it's anecdotal evidence, but for me at least, the Tensor chip has been reliable. What's weird
weird though is we often hear about how much better the tensor chip is at AI and machine learning and I'm sure it helps with things like the live dictation you know the transcribing of your voice memos and stuff a lot of people say it's impressive with its awareness of punctuation but whenever I tried it I still found little mistakes it would make not a big deal because I'm not really looking for someone to transcribe that many voice memos but a lot of the time we talk about the machine learning with the cameras and how that unlocks these new magic editor tools that allow you to erase things in the background or move your subjects around and that's cool and I've tested it and it kind of works but what's weird is for you to access the magic editor with this phone you have to back up the photos to Google you can't do it on device you can't do it without backing it up to the cloud which makes me wonder if you need to back it up to the cloud for these features to work what is the tensor chip actually doing like is all the neural net training actually done on a server somewhere but only the tensor chip knows how to actually execute on that neural net training I don't know it feels kind of weird it kind of feels like the type of thing that you could probably add to all Android phones and Google is just kind of exclusively giving themselves software advantages Apple does the same thing so I wouldn't be surprised if Google is doing the same thing where they software lock to certain features. I'm well aware the Pixel 8 Pro has a bunch of extra Pro tools and Pro features that this phone doesn't have. Most of them though I don't really care about so I don't mind. Not a big fan of telephoto lenses at this point when we've got a 48 megapixel sensor already and I can punch in 8x and still have you know kind of that AI enhancement mode. It's fine for general telephoto shots. It's only those people that are looking for like space zoom that want to have the best of the best possible telephoto shots but that's just not me. And while I tried the magic editor quite a bit with this phone, it never quite wowed me the way it did in Google's demos. It always looked way better in their marketing images than it did whenever I tried it out. And it still, in my opinion, doesn't come anywhere close to as helpful or as useful in day-to-day -day photo editing as iOS subject lift. Just being able to, on any photo, whether you took it on the iPhone or not, whether you backed it up to iCloud or not, doesn't matter. You can just look at a picture and select the subject and then lift it out of that photo and you can throw it in iMessage, you can throw it in a photo editing app and just have a really easy experience moving it around. Whereas this, you can highlight a subject and move the subject around that photo if it's backed up to Google, but you can't necessarily just copy it or like lift it out of that photo, put it into another app, which maybe there's some third party app that does that for you, but I haven't found it. And if there is a third party app that does that, then I guess it's not exclusive to this phone in the first place. So the subject detection is somewhat impressive, but I don't find myself often running into use cases where I'm like, oh, I need to move the car in this photo or I need to move the subject over just a little bit. That usually doesn't come up. But as someone who makes YouTube videos and someone who makes video thumbnails a lot, it's very, very common for me to want to take a picture and just lift the subject out of it and put it in a different app so I can edit it more. So cool machine learning algorithms that help you like erase people in the background. But I don't know, I guess that's never really bothered me all that much. Maybe one or two times in the past couple weeks, I've been like, oh yeah, let me, let me just erase this person, but then it doesn't quite get it exactly right in the background, which I think just opens the door for more pixel peeping, which if you're a smartphone reviewer trying to zoom in and say, oh yeah, I can see little differences or little things that are off, then you're not the kind of person who's gonna appreciate the magic eraser because you're gonna zoom in and see, oh yeah, there's little imperfections. It didn't quite reassemble that background perfectly. You gotta be someone who just looks at the overall photo and doesn't pinch to zoom too much on it. But if you're that kind of person, you're also not gonna care too much about if there's a person in the background that you didn't want to be there. So I don't know, little gimmicky, little more niche than I thought, but that's not to say this is a bad camera because quite the contrary, this is the best camera in a smartphone I've basically ever experienced. Noted I have not checked out an iPhone 15 Pro yet, so maybe I should reserve judgment for that, but basically all of the tech and Halosive EV videos I've recorded over the past couple weeks were all shot with the Pixel 8. And not only is the video quality astounding as Mark Marquez has showcased on his autofocus channel as well. Great contrast ratio, great colors, great motion and lighting and everything. But also the camera app has been so much more useful to me than the iOS camera app because when I wanted to record tech or EV videos with this phone, I could just set it up, plug my microphone straight into it thanks to USB-C. And now they actually give you way more camera settings within that app, including the option to select your external microphone, which not all Android phones do, mind you. I've tested others in the past that didn't really support this. iPhones really only started supporting it just recently now that they've got Type-C, but still, even with my iPhone 15, and I'm sure it would be the same with the 15 Pro, it's kind of like shooting in the dark, whether or not the iPhone is actually picking up the external microphone or the internal microphone, because you just kind of plug in the mic and boot it up
up and hope that the iPhone is connected. Sometimes it would connect, sometimes it wouldn't. Usually it would work fine if I closed the camera app, plugged in the external mic, and then launched it on iOS. But with this phone, it doesn't matter because when you plug in the external mic, it lets you know right away, hey, there's another mic plugged in. You can switch your microphone inputs. You can switch between the onboard microphone, the external microphone, or even the microphone in the Pixel Buds. I haven't seen that as an option on iOS. Like, hey, I want to record a video, use the onboard AirPod mics. So, so many sound controls, which is useful for a content creator like me. And when you couple a great external microphone with a great onboard camera, you just get a super duper easy video recording experience, which I've loved because obviously I don't have to worry about focusing like I do with my Blackmagic camera. And this phone ships with 128 gigs of storage by default, of course, which is nice. But also it has USB-C 3.2, the same speed USB port as the iPhone 15 Pros have, which you gotta spend a thousand dollars on, whereas this one, of course, is only 700 bucks. And when you're done recording a video, I could just plug it into my Mac. And sometimes I would get a little bit of software bugginess with the Android file transfer Mac app. But for the most part, when it did work, you could plug it in, hit file transfer on the Android, and boom, I could move over a six or seven gigabyte video file that already has my audio attached to it. And it would transfer within like a minute. Whereas before, if I wanted to airdrop it or transfer it through a USB 2 data connection, it would definitely take much longer. So as someone who records a lot of videos, this phone has been super nice, super useful. And even when recording, you know, 15, 16, 20 minute 4K at 60 videos, and this thing is simultaneously powering my microphone, mind you, during that entire experience, it never overheated. And also I never killed the battery in a day. The battery life for me at least has been great. Granted, I've been kind of accustomed to an old iPhone 11 with 84% battery health. So I'm not spoiled with the flagship iPhone battery lives that maybe some of you are accustomed to. But just couple that super fast USB-C port with this amazing camera sensor and you've got a great video production tool, even if you're a Mac user, in my opinion. Google was able to stuff all of this great hardware in here and still make room for a physical SIM tray, which made transferring my SIM to this phone so much easier than having to fuss around with eSIM. That was part of the reason I wasn't able to transfer my SIM over to the iPhone 15 because each carrier is different and they're going to have a different process for getting it set up and it also makes transferring your SIM backwards a lot harder if you go electronically whereas physical SIM tray you know you just can't kind of go wrong with it it's very simple so a lot of you may be asking then if Drew you love this thing so much you've been happy with the camera you've been using it a lot am I officially making the switch to the Pixel 8 is now the time to try out Android and while I have to be honest with you all this is definitely the closest I've ever felt to wanting to switch to Android I've got my great 120 Hertz I got 2000 nits I've got USB-C which you all know how passionate I am about that I've got the great transfer speeds and also couple that with Google now promising seven years of software support who knows maybe they'll live up to that hype maybe they won't but what's the issue here Drew if it's all going so great why don't you switch and well I think that brings us back to that age-old question that debate that it all stems back to the software what matters more the display itself or what's on the display and that's where a lot of the shortcomings for me unfortunately play into the decision to either keep my sim in this or my old iPhone 11 and the sad part about that is a lot of this is not even really Google's fault a lot of this is up to third-party app developers not optimizing their apps or putting in that much work into their Android versions and that unfortunately is kind of a big reason I use my phone right is because of the third-party apps on it like for me the biggest one is Twitter which yes is still called that but now that that's become a source of income for my job I spend way more time on Twitter than pretty much any other app and the truth is the Twitter for Android app is substantially lacking compared to the Twitter for iOS app not only are there missing features like being able to rearrange my nav bar on iOS it lets me put my profile down there on Android it just straight up doesn't the feature just doesn't exist but also the menu bar loves to disappear on Android whenever you start scrolling and I know that sounds like a small thing but if you're using Twitter a lot both for news and for keeping up with people then that starts to get really annoying also the notification icons are horribly out of sync and not accurate on Android where it'll say that you have unread DMs I go to DMs there's nothing that's unread or you'll get new DMs and you won't get notifications for them then I'll notice that hey I haven't responded to someone that reached out to me hours ago that gets really annoying very very quickly and also the impressions on tweets which kind of directly ties into how much you're making on Twitter they don't update 
in real time and I can go to my old four-year-old iPhone 11 and see the Twitter impressions update a lot faster and a lot more accurately whereas on Android sometimes they just straight up disappear or they provide really really old numbers on there and just navigating the user menus are more clunky the scrolling doesn't feel as fluid it doesn't have that nice gentle rubber band effect that you get on iOS and it's not just one of these things it's like a bunch of them all stacking up together that makes it much much harder to use a lot of third-party applications so Twitter is probably the biggest one for me but another one is definitely the GoDaddy studio app which is what I make all of my video thumbnails with they don't have as many features on there for some reason like I can't copy a layer and paste it onto another project which I didn't realize I do a lot until I switched to Android then I realized oh not having that feature is kind of annoying when you're using a lot of different subjects and artifacts and layers between different files on GoDaddy and you want to take some from one project and move them over to another that saves you a crap ton of time especially because this doesn't have the iOS style subject lift but that's purely up to the third party developer at least I think it is I've been asking people on Twitter like how come so many Android version of apps are missing things or not as good as the iOS version and a lot of people said it comes down to the software that Google and Apple makes for their third party developers Apple spends a lot of time optimizing Xcode and pouring money into making sure that menus and buttons and dials are responsive and fluid whenever you implement them that Google just doesn't put as much of an effort in. Maybe that's because Google kills off things all the time. So it's very easy to write an application for Android. I'm sure it's even cheaper because you don't have to pay that $100 a year thing. And Apple probably forces their third-party developers to keep apps up to date a lot more than Google does because Apple's like, hey, if you haven't updated your app in two years, then we're just going to kick it off the App Store. So make sure you optimize it for our new phones. Of course, the iOS App Store only has to optimize for a few dozen different iPhones, whereas Android, you gotta optimize for literally thousands of different models, which just maybe is a little bit harder, but these are the kinds of things that start to stack up. Like, I wanted to switch some of my credit cards over, my non-Apple card, to Google Wallet, and I tried, and it said this card can't be added at this time. I even tried to sign in and activate through the City Mobile app so I could manage my bank account, and when I tried to sign in, it's just like, oh, unable to sign in at this time. Also, the biometrics here are a little bit more split for me because Google did improve the face unlock capabilities on the Pixel 8 so now you can unlock your bank account using your face but it's only if you have really good lighting I've discovered like if you're in an even little bit of a dark environment and you try to access your banking app through the face unlock it'll just say not enough light use the fingerprint reader and the fingerprint reader is fast and works well for me but the nice advantage of Android at least so I don't have to worry too much about the biometrics is extend unlock so the phone just knows when I'm at home and it stays unlocked when I'm inside because I live in a safe place. I have locks on my doors and everything. We're not worried about someone breaking in and just reading through my text messages or whatever. So once I go out and I am unlocking it, yeah, Face ID, I think, tends to work a bit more reliably because it doesn't worry about the lighting environment. Doesn't even really need to get that much of your face to unlock, whereas this one, I've discovered if, like, part of my face is on a pillow or something, it just says, oh, I can't do it. There's not enough information. So I would rather have one really good biometric than two okay biometrics but the fingerprint reader is honestly pretty fine so i'm happy that google is offering seven years of feature updates to the pixel 8 but that only affects like the native apps and for sure like i went with pixel over many other brands i could have gone with samsung or oneplus or whatever do they still exist in america at this point but the reason i wanted to go with google is because i like vertical integration right google owns android and the tensor chip and the pixel hardware and i already pay for YouTube Premium. I'm a heavy YouTube music user, and I watch a lot of YouTube videos, of course. I watch that more than pretty much any other streaming site. On top of that, I use Gmail. I have Google speakers throughout the house, not HomePods. I use Google Drive for sharing files, so I'm already using a ton of Google services on my iPhone, which is why I was kind of considering, like, yeah, maybe I should just take the plunge. Maybe I should just go all in on the Pixel if I'm using so many Google services, but truthfully, the third-party app support and couple that with the other big elephant in the room, Room, Apple making it very hard to switch to Android not because the whole iMessage thing I think that gets overblown maybe it's just because I'm friends with normal human beings that don't like mock me or make fun of me for breaking the group chats or being the green bubble that's not really been a big issue and I've actually got to experience RCS for the first time with this phone and I've realized oh this is really nice in fact even though I'm breaking other people's group chats it doesn't look broken to me because while on iOS you get that big you know drew liked and then the the paragraph and the message has to be sent all over again.
in anytime there's a reaction. Google is smart enough to fix all of that. So I don't get the second paragraph. I just get the little reaction. So by Apple not supporting RCS, it really just makes the iOS experience look bad. It doesn't make the Android experience that much worse. And I have features that can rival AirDrop, like I use NearDrop a ton to quickly share pictures and videos from my phone to my Mac and NearDrop doesn't do everything AirDrop does, but it does 90% of what I use AirDrop for, which is just sending stuff from my phone to my Mac. And that works fine. But of course the hardest part, which I've talked about in the past, is definitely gotta be Apple Card in the Apple Wallet. Not only do I love the Apple Card because it simplifies banking and I kind of hate dealing with third party bank, you know, credit cards and finance information. They make it so hard to manage all that stuff and Apple makes it just so much more infinitely simpler. I love the savings account on there. We love the high interest rates and I love how well integrated it is. You know, I hate having to sign up for more bank accounts, having another email, another password, another pin to remember by, and another clunky, badly made, poorly optimized third party application. I hate having to deal with all of that, which is why I love doing it through Apple and Google doesn't really rival that in any way. Google doesn't have their own credit card. They don't have their own wallet with a high interest savings account, which I definitely want. If they could match all of the Apple card and savings account features, then I would consider switching because I don't want to have to open another bank account because I hate dealing with banks. Whereas I have to have an Apple ID, you know, to have an Apple product. I have to have a Gmail and a Google account because I already use those services. So I would much rather manage my finances, you know, my credit card transactions and my savings account through a service that I'm already using to simplify my ecosystem. So I don't have to keep track of all these passwords and all these different email accounts and all these different banking apps that are going to be optimized or unoptimized. And some of them are going to be better than others. So I prefer the native like first party approach to finance and Apple does not let you access anything in regards to the Apple card or the savings account outside of the iOS app. You can't really manage the savings account at all from the web. You can barely make a payment on your credit card through the web, but you can't see the individual transactions, which is important to me. So it's very, very hard for me to switch away from iOS to Android purely because of a lot of third party app optimization not being as good. And that is what I spend the most amount of time on my phone doing is using other third party apps. And also the first party experience that Google does not really rival over here in regards to the credit card in the savings account. So I've been very, very close to considering, eh, maybe I should close my Apple card. You know, maybe I could just switch to some other bank and use some other savings account. But then I realized, you know what? Even if I go through using a third party bank, which of course isn't gonna be Google because they don't offer that, then I'm gonna have to deal with the crappy unoptimized version on the Google Play Store. I'm not even gonna get the best of the best third party app experience because I gotta go through Android instead of iOS. And I don't wanna have to deal with managing like, you know, how it affects your credit score and having to transfer all of these accounting and wiring numbers from my savings account. That's honestly just a big hassle. And while I love this camera and I love this phone design, I come back to that original claim that I've been making for the past few months. Should you upgrade your phone based on how good a new one is? Or should you upgrade based on how bad your current one is? And truthfully, there's nothing inherently that wrong with my iPhone 11. I mostly use wireless charging anyway. I still have a pretty great camera for recording my YouTube videos. And maybe before I take a big trip where I'm not going to be able to pack my black magic again, I'll consider upgrading then and look at kind of what the used market and refurbished market is like. But at least right now, I also got to take my own advice and acknowledge that buying a Pixel phone brand new is not necessarily the best idea because even with their seven years of software support, the resale value on these things has been known to tank very fast. So even if you love this phone and it's perfect the way it is, you could probably find it for like half price if you just wait a couple of months. You'll find Pixel 8s for probably under $400 by January, February. That's not very long, so if you can hold on to your existing phone for a little bit longer, you'll probably save yourself a ton of money. And while I've never been more tempted than I am right now, unfortunately, yes, I will be sticking with my iPhone. Oh, thank God! <laughs> and I'll just basically be waiting for a lot of third-party app support to finally get addressed on Android, as well as Google making their own wallet app a bit more beefed up like Apple's. Seriously, this transition would have been far more digestible for me if Google had their own credit card that was well integrated within the wallet app. They had their own savings account with high interest, maybe better than Apple's. That would motivate me to say, yes, okay, it's worth the switch. It's worth the hassle of dealing with some of those unoptimized apps. It's worth the hassle of having kind of a broken ecosystem, kind of pushing down the walls of the garden a little bit. But not having that and knowing that canceling my whole Apple wallet thing is going to affect my credit score and all that is just 
just, eh, this is not worth it. But that does not change my opinion that Google did a fantastic job with this phone. Absolutely would recommend if you're already in the Android ecosystem, maybe you don't care about those Apple wallet things. This is just a fantastic piece of hardware. And in my opinion, Google, which makes sense, they're the ones who own Android, they're making the best Android phones in my opinion. You can disagree with me on that, but with the software support, the design, the cameras, the battery life and everything, I just feel like there's no other Android phone at this point I'd be more interested in than this one. What do you guys think of the Pixel hardware? Do you think it's much, much better than it used to be, or do you think it's still rant worthy? Feel free to let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and thank you to everybody supporting this channel directly. Seriously, helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos, so thanks again. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you all in the next one.